So I'm turning it over to Dr. Corbett. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate being asked and invited to come. Uh, the name of the presentation is How Full Is Your Toolbox? Trying to understand some of the teaching strategies that can help you be a little bit more successful. So without further ado, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on theory behind this. I can tell you it is evidence-based and we'll just touch on just a few thoughts. So like any good educator, we have to have objectives. Um, we just want you to understand uh, the purpose of instructional design and then uh, help you with enhancing your own um, class and classroom. And it can be any classroom other than the nursing classroom. So I hope you can see this. It says, take out your phones, open the American History app, and turn to the page about George Washington. What does that tell you? Anybody? Anybody? Engaging tools. Oh. Younger generation. We've got a younger generation. We're talking to somebody who's different than, than we were, than we are as students. Anybody else out there? Jan, Jeanette? Anybody chat? Can hear me? I can I'm, hear who I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Can you oh, hear me? <laughs> okay. I haven't done it by phone before. I'm not at my own computer, so it, it's a little different. Okay. Uh, I think. Oh, good. Who is this? Oh, I'm Jeanette. Um, yes, yeah, so that they have uh, new technology we didn't have before. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we can engage that technology as faculty. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, how we can go about that. There we go. <laughs> I want you to take a look at these four pictures, four very different pictures, and tell me what these images have in common. Style. Style. They came to you by internet. Okay. Internet. What else? Anybody? Modern. Modern. Hmm. They are all visual. Say again. A lot of visuals. Okay, visual. Especially the greenery. Okay. It's all about youth. Okay. Mary's comment was they were all graphic, and then I didn't catch the end of that. Okay. Let's see if I can pull that up again. Uh, they're graphic information for student learning is what Mary said. Okay. The word that I was kind of looking for was design. They all took effort to design those. And obviously, any of these pictures that we just saw, I'll pull them up again, could not have been just arbitrarily put together. They had to take, a, there was a lot of effort and thought to build the building, to put the uh, horticulture together, to uh, look at the different fashion. So it just takes a lot of thinking, and I would like for us in instructional design to put the same, not the same level, but to put some true thought into how we go about designing instruction. So it's all about the design. There is a theorist behind this. His name is Charlie Rigeluth. He thinks that learning can be made easier with correct design. Learning can be enjoyable, and there's optimal models of instruction. You can't use the same model over and over, but there are optimal models. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Do you agree? Disagree? Agree. Agree? Uh-huh. All right. Very good. There's also a theory of engagement. Engagement's a state of mind. It involves motivation. You want to, you want to be engaged. You want to do something, and it's kind of playful. So. We want to engage our students. We want to take where they are in their life and design instruction that's appropriate for them. So uh, that's the real basic, but now here comes the nuts and bolts for us. And these are the strategies that, uh, that I'm prepared to present today. And I thought what I would do is leave it up to you to decide what you are interested in learning about. So what I can do is give you just a moment to look these uh, topics over, case studies, concept mapping, explain it, name it, factor fabrication, gaming, illustrated lecture, illustration, jigsaw, 
lecture enhanced with technology, and clicks like questioning. That's mostly for our nursing faculty, so we don't have to go down that route. <laughs> Pausing, peer instruction, problem-based learning, puzzles, reflection, role-playing, simulate, simulation, think, pair, share. So give this just a minute of thought, and we will spend the rest of the time talking about each one of these strategies. And at, at some point, whenever you uh, would like to make a selection, just speak out. Concept mapping and think here should be my topic. Okay, so we have concept mapping. So let's go ahead, and what I will do, oh, Dr. Millicent Milliken wants games and puzzle. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the, uh, the strategy. I'm going to tell you what type of learner. I'm going to give you an example, but then I would like you to chime in and see how you would use this in your own personal um, teaching. So let's go ahead to concept mapping. Concept mapping, it's a pictorial description of related concepts. Uh, if you have the picture of a Venn diagram in mind, often um, that could be a sort of concept map. Uh, these are excellent for visual learners. Uh, they're great for making concepts connect and kinetic learners. And uh, we can use it easily at the end of a content review. It's not so good to teach a subject, but to review a subject. So I love speed mapping. This is so much fun. And what I do is in groups of three or four, let me see if I have, oh, shoot. Let me go back. Uh, in groups of three or four, I will have one person, uh, if I give them a topic, at the end of a classroom, period. And I uh, say, tell me everything that you learned today. But I'm only going to give you 15 seconds to write everything that you learned down. And so in 15 seconds, I time them. They write everything that they learned down. And then they pass it to their partner. And their partner, and they receive their partner's papers out of the three or four, and then they get 10 seconds to add to the list. And then you pass your papers around, depending on the size of your group, and you try and complete the list. That's called speed mapping. It's a lot of fun because it's very tightly timed. People laugh. I often have to give them a few extra seconds at the very beginning just mm -hmm. to get them going because they're having so much fun. Um, so can anybody think of a time where they might use concept and or speed mapping? Research class. It's a new well, language and lots good. of new content. Lots of new content. What did you learn? How did you learn it? Um, Dr. Smith, would you use it at the beginning of class? Like to see where they are to start off with or at the end of class? I like to use it after we've had interaction because I don't like the word lecture. Right? Interaction and before we do application. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have an application for speed mapping or concept mapping? Anybody? Maybe right after a video. After a, oh, that's mm -hmm. great. After a video, what did you learn? Would you tell the students beforehand that they were going to speed map after the video? Probably. Well, I don't know. Maybe. No. I would probably give them a heads up because then they're going to pay attention a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Put their phones away. Yeah, put their phones away. There's a time and a place for phones. Okay, concept mapping. What was the other one, Dr.? Go to games. Okay, games. Dr. Milliton wanted gaming. So let's go to gaming. An interactive process to apply information. Boy, that's really broad. <laughs> Um, it's great for kinetic and auditory learners. It's competitive. Uh, you can use it for all types of uh, levels of information, independent review. I'm a huge gamer in my classroom, and I've played the following games. Jeopardy, Family Feud. Family Feud is great when you want to have uh, teams in class on both sides, and you put up your concept, and you try and identify the concepts. We are actually going to play the, uh, the game Name It here in a minute. I, does anybody remember the game Go Fish? 
when you were a kid. Yeah, if you got kids. If you so, got yeah. kids, that's and right. And you try and do some matching. You can do some matching. I, pray, I played grow fetus when I was <laughs> teaching about uh, fetal growth. That was a lot of fun. Trivia, Hollywood Squares. So hmm. uh, one thing that you really, really need to keep in mind when you are gaming uh, is when you are working with English as a second language students and they didn't grow up with the games that we grew up with. How about Grow Anova? Love it, Dr. Milliken. What? <laughs> Grow Anova. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jeopardy and Family Feud and a few others are actually a PowerPoint posted into the faculty resource guide to go there and locate it. It gives you the URL yeah. right to it and be able to populate them. To populate them. Yep, absolutely. Oh, no. Yeah. Ooh. So uh, in the faculty resource guide. I'll send you the link. Awesome. Okay, yeah. we'll get the link out to yeah. you. Um, all of these things that I have been able to get on the internet, so you don't have to create them yourselves. So, so let's go ahead and play the game. Name it. Name it is what I'm going to give you are uh, various terms, a list of adjectives or words, and you have to identify what the topic is. Okay. Um, if you remember the war of uh, the game pyramid, it's played much like pyramid. Okay, thousand million dollar pyramid, whatever they have now. So let's get going. Name me. I was moved Gold. during World War II to Gold. Fort Knox. <laughs> the 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 first uh, thought was gold, and that is not correct. Oh, it's, it's a gold color even. Oh. <laughs> All right, so let's try the next clue. Uh, and the, the, the purpose, or when you're designing this, you can, your, your clues need to get progressively easier to give them more information about what the topic is. So let's go to the next clue. Prepared in secret. Ooh, the atomic bomb. The, the guess is the atomic bomb, and it's still not quite correct. Oh, you're a good player. Thank you for playing. Prepared for the in secret. <laughs> Please drive through. Really <laughs> Planned uh -huh. where they were going to bomb? Nope. Nope. Okay, let's, let's go on to the next clue. Ratified by nine states in 1788. Constitution? Yes! All right! Yes! Constitution. Written in the Pennsylvania State House, and I was getting after the Constitution of the United States. So, I mean, that was very engaging. It kept you going. Uh, it kept you interacting with everybody. Lots and lots of fun to play that game. Yeah, because that's, that is not the anything near what I would have thought based on the first two. Stayed on the first two. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would be great for a history lesson, perhaps. All right. Puzzles. Another one that Dr. Milliken wanted. Puzzles. These are great for vocabulary-focused activities, um, individual or group activities when you have a lecture that's steep in nomenclature. Uh, or an introduction of content or a review. Often the beginning of a chapter will have all the terms in there. Uh, and I will take all those terms and you can go to an online crossword populator and, uh, and, and use that. So crosswords are good. Hangman or seek a word where hangman you... Hangman is fabulous. Hangman Nurses really get on to it because they try to pick that patient. That's right. <laughs> they get really right. We, we, we don't want our patient to die. <laughs> so we play hangman. Yeah, so that's a great... Anybody have any other thoughts about when they might use this strategy? Nan own, own wily purposes. <laughs> so Nan could you could put the French uh, word in there in the description the in in English or French and mm -hmm. then find it. That would be mm -hmm. great for for any uh, foreign language. That would be good. Anything Criminal else? Justice. Criminal justice. To so put clues together. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh huh. Yeah. Get it. Execution. <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> Nurses don't like it. They fight for it. That's right. We're not going to do that. 
So those are some of the puzzles that you can integrate. Again, a lot of fun. You can hear the laughter here in the in the live review here. Okay, who else wants to choose? Oh, on puzzles. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, just a question. Uh -huh. I understand that there are quite a few um, places you can go uh -huh. online that are free. Yes. For crossword puzzles to fill in right. or help you. Do mm -hmm. you know any of those that we could? You do. We could probably put together a list of uh, websites that uh, could facilitate this this presentation. Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Corbett, one thing that we are working on under puzzles, we have a, a course that we're adding instructional design theory to, and mm -hmm. one of his uh, inserts was a crossword puzzle. But how do we get individuals who can't see the puzzle engaged? So we flipped the puzzle where we provided the definition in the letters. Okay. Or not the, the, the yes, we, we provided the definition in a hint, ten uh -huh. letters, oh. so they could still use the crossword puzzle okay. and not feel left out. Oh, okay. So it might be uh -huh. an alternative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. so there is an online crossword filler that you can use it um, live. Excellent. Yes. Really? Yes. Excellent. There's an online live crossword filler. Yep. Yep. So. Thank okay. You. Sorry. I know no, you were... no. 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 Jigsaw. Jan wanted jigsaw. So let's do jigsaw. Hmm. Jigsaw is for uh, a group. Uh, develops information on a portion of a topic. Just a portion. And then one member of a group reports on that information to a group representing the whole. So think of a 4x4 four four or a 5x5 five five member group. So what I do is I tell this, the first group of four develop information on the signs and symptoms of pneumonia. And then the second group will do nursing care for pneumonia. And then group three will be medications used for pneumonia. And group four will be post-discharge or post uh, discharge instructions. So I have four groups now developing very specific content. And they're all doing it together. And then what I do is I say, now disperse into groups of four where each one of you has your very specific topic. And then you present your topic to the other three, and then you do a workaround. And that's called jigsawing. Kind of complicated mm -hmm. to get your brain wrapped around it. Um, it's great for group learning. It's excellent for auditory learners because they hear. And yeah. has anybody in here heard of Edgar Dale? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would be very surprised if many of you didn't hear about Edgar Dale, <laughs> but just because we will go to Mr. Dale, and uh, he says that you remember 10% about what you read, and when your students say, I can't remember anything I read, well, that's because the research says you're only going to remember about 10%, but you do remember 20% of what you hear, 30% of what you see, and if you see it and hear it, you're all the way up to 50%. If you discuss it, you're at 70. If you experience it, you're at 90. And then if you teach it, you're at 95. Which so, is why open book testing is difficult for a lot of people. Yes? Because why? Go ahead. Because if you've only read it, okay, and then you have to take an open book test, it is more difficult. It is more difficult. And Unless you somewhere, where is it? Because you mm -hmm. don't have that Okay. Yeah. But that's why discussion is so valuable uh, because if you discuss it, discuss it, you're up to your 70 percent. Uh, many of your um, uh, med uh, medicine and nursing, they have a, a lot of practicum because the experiential portion is so important that you remember 80 percent of what you experience and then uh, ultimately to be the teacher, you're going to remember it even more. So, and Dr. Cormick, I'll have to say that having just taught a class you developed that had discussion in it, often we hardly got past the discussion. Mm -hmm. The discussions were so lively and interesting and, and great learning experiences. Yeah. Good. Good. I think if you apply this 
if we look at our online courses that we develop. Yes, absolutely. We're so stuck. In We're that so stuck in degree. reading and hearing and seeing. We're discussing and working experience into an online course. I think is is really imperative to get that learning information across. I agree, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think your table tells us so much in so different, mm -hmm. many many different ways. But what I'm drawn to is the reading, and because of that, we need to so focus on making a lot of our information bullets as long as they're meaningful. Uh -huh. We need to condense it and consider how the eye follows the page and how the student is attracted to it, to putting eye candy in our courses. Uh -huh. I just think that's so very, very important. I don't think a lot of our students are good readers anyway. Now, on top of that, usually if they are, they probably don't want to read. Uh -huh. So way that we construct our courses really needs to consider that. Yep. And that's before we get to the classroom or engaging in them. Right. So, Mr. Dale. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the presentations would be helpful there for their kind of teaching in a way when they put together, even if it's PowerPoint or anything like that, that they're basically uh, learning it and then sharing it. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Then they become the teacher, and then they learn it mm -hmm. so much better. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think when we ask our, our students to give a presentation, I would be very, very happy if they completely got away from PowerPoint whatsoever. Yours is wonderful. I'm not reflecting right. on that. But the students are not always interesting, so I like for them to get into character. Mm -hmm. I think it mm -hmm. or get into some type of character where they make it interesting. You know, they can sing, dance, create a poem. <laughs> they can get into somebody's character. They can do a group gamification. Just whatever it is, but mm -hmm. make it fun. And mm -hmm. I know that it sounds like it gets away from the actual curriculum. However, I've had students that, that graduated and within a couple of months wrote me a letter saying, Dr. Washburn had no idea why we were doing that. But my boss needed to make a presentation and couldn't be that there that day and he made me do it. And he said, for no more I knew on the subject, I tried to make it interesting and now they all come to me for the guest speaker. There you go. So oh. excellent. What a compliment. Yeah. So there's a lot of things. It's just exactly mm -hmm. like you say, when you have to teach it, you become mm -hmm. an expert. You push yourself harder. Right. But also mm -hmm. you, our presentation skills are usually not such that attracts the learner. Mm -hmm. So I like for the students to get into character and and present any way except for traditional. So can anybody think of a way that they would use jigsawing in the classroom? Hmm. We did it with our, um, this is a classroom, but it's with the handbook. With the handbook, yes, mm -hmm. to do an early introduction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We did do jigsawing with the yeah. handbook. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yep. That really works well, and you can do it in the introduction for, with your syllabus. Uh -huh. um, would be a lot of fun, a way to liven up that content a little bit. So that's jigsawing, yeah. Um, I really hate to say this, but we probably only have time for one or two more. So, Dr. Yep, mm -hmm, uh -huh. Frazier. <laughs> uh, fact or fabrication? Fact or uh -huh. fabrication. Given a phrase, the student or group of students must indicate if the phrase is a fact or a fabrication. If the phrase is a fabrication, they must change it into a fact. So best done in a group of four or less or break the students up into groups of four. This is nice. Any level of content, and it's really good for the auditory learner. So I'm going to give you a sample. This is an easy one. Fact or fabrication? Before a ball game, the Star Spangled Banner is played. Gentlemen in the stadium should remove their hats. Fact or fabrication? Fact. Fact. Sexism. <laughs> Why is this one of the choices? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> as far as it goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, who, when might you use this in the classroom? 
This would be great, like in history or political science. History or political science, or, yeah. I don't know, psychology. Oh, does it count? Oh, oh, does it count? Yeah. Oh, lots of uh -huh. it really be applied to any discipline. Yes, uh -huh. it is yeah. cross discipline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. This is a really nice one across discipline. Mm -hmm. I will uh, say that you have to be prepared that the students will oh, say. Did you see? Uh, to be prepared that the students will say, "Well, I remember first thing that I hear." you know, and to, to say, I don't want to learn this way. And um, my response to them, as I've heard this many times, is you need to be, I, to be able to identify what's correct and what's not correct because you're going to get a lot of information in life that's not correct and you are need to be responsible to correct it. So, so quantitative methods is when Dr. Milliken is going to use this one. Which so. is easier than fly slaughters, probably. <laughs> <laughs> But to me, that yes. ties directly into critical thinking. Absolutely. Yes. Uh-huh. That's critical thinking. Absolutely. And I've played it like a game. You know, I've let them uh, discuss, the students amongst themselves, discuss it, and then, you know, come up with the answer, and everybody says factor fabrication in their, in their various groups, and if it's fabrication, then what to do to make it a fact. So, um, okay, one more. How are you using pausing to be the to be the most helpful for the students? Okay, let's do pausing. Because I know you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> this is to uh, for uh, people who want to lecture, which is not a four-letter word. Uh, about every fifteen to twenty minutes, you take a break in the lecture and allow students to compare notes with their peers. Oh. And it works well, followed by questioning. So let's think about this. One, the students have to be taking notes, which we don't always see nowadays. But if it's important for students to take notes, then, uh, then they can pass their notes around and discuss what they just heard. I break the students up into what I call pods, uh, no more than six in a pod. And I studied this, the effects of this, in the nursing classroom, and it definitely improved engagement didn't improve overall learning, but I used it in an advanced classroom. Uh, the, the, um, the literature, when this was first demonstrated uh, in the literature, they used it in a chemistry class. So, yes, Dr. Smith. I know it's not the same, but is this as helpful, more helpful, etc., than like clickers? Uh, it's as engaging as clickers. Uh, what this does is it validates to each other what they know and what they don't know. Clickers doesn't always do that. So if you have your pods, your groups of four to six, no more than six, uh, you have them pass around their notes, they have them discuss it, that's a deeper level of learning because the literature is replete to say that students learn better from the students than they do from the faculty. And that allows that deeper level of learning what do you have to do? What do you have to give up? You have to give up about five minutes every 20 minutes uh, in, in your lecture. But then what I would do is I would follow this with a question to validate what they've just learned. And then I would use a similar question, not the same question, but a similar question on an exam so the students then get the reinforcement that this discussion is very important. The questioning afterward is very important. And I can see how this all ties together. So that's pausing. Thank you. So um, we have to bring this to a close to respect another. Oh, thank you, Dr. Milliken. So uh, to summary, the purpose of instructional design is to what? Engage the student. Learn. Engage the student in their learning. What else? Was each uh, sampled method strategy the same? No. No. Improve learning by application. Okay, so there's a, a lot of what you're doing. You, you saw a lot of application. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Instructional design is purposeful. Mm -hmm. It's intentional. And um, and not every method is meant for every topic. And you must cater to preferences. Okay. Learning style preferences. Preferences. 
I'm not a learning styles person. I, I know. Mother, right. But the preference and <laughs> way someone when, takes in information, right. you've got to take that into consideration when you right. design. Absolutely. It, it looks at preferences. Absolutely. And so have you been able to multiply, identify multiple methodologies that you could use in the classroom? Absolutely. So I think we've met the objectives of our class. And if you are interested, those are the references used to um, develop this presentation.